Beach, John Gregory. <laughs> John, welcome. Hello. Welcome to GoForCon UK. Well, it's lovely to um, be here again. Um, long time comer, first time speaker. That's probably the wrong word, but uh, yeah. Defin definitely wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll fix that in edit. So we'll do the Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, do, we'll, we'll, re we'll retake that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you just told me, you told me recently that you did uh, the f fastest zip wire in Wales. Right? I believe it's the fastest one in the world. And it's a zip wire, like a. Z yeah, from like the top of the mountain right over the quarry all the way down the other side. That's I think that's quite cool. 100 miles an hour? Oh, that's too Ace first? Just on, suspended in the air? Yeah, yep, yep, yep. yep. Uh, no, no. <laughs> um, and you do also like 3D printing and 3D modeling? Yep. So 3D modeling like yourself, like you're a 3D model? Or uh, you do the. On yeah. <laughs> Mostly uh, like costuming parts and, you know, replacement parts for various things. Yeah, very cool. I love 3D printing. Okay, well, I'm very excited to hear your talk. So without further ado, please get on with it. Thank you. <laughs> So, hi, uh, welcome along. Hope everyone's suitably caffeinated in the wake. I'm probably not, but you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll get through it. So, quickly, uh, my name's John. I've been working in software and tech since about the year 2000, and I've been working with Go, sort of personally and professionally, since around 2016. Currently, I'm working at Admiral Financial Services as a senior software engineer, where in addition to you know, just a day job, I'm helping lead the adoption of Go across the organization. In addition, outside of work, um, despite this small pandemic that seems to have got in the way of people actually getting together, I co-run the Cardiff Go meetup as well. Um, if anyone wants a Cardiff Go sticker, we can probably sort that out. So, my talk today is on a proof of concept tool I started developing in my previous job at the Office for National Statistics back in late 2019. I'll start with just a little bit of background on the Office for National Statistics, the ONS, because I don't want to keep saying statistics too much. Um, then I'll go through the key technologies I chose and generally why I chose to use those ones. Then we'll look at how some of it comes together with some code examples and just sort of have a look at how you can maybe use similar patterns to build your own things. So, how did we get here? Uh, you've probably heard of the Office for National Statistics. Um, it comes up in the news when people are quoting things like unemployment statistics, um, retail sales index, most popular baby names. They do quite a lot. And it very much does what it says on the tin. It's a government department concerned with UK-based national statistics. It was formed in around 1996 through the merger of a couple of much longer departments. And as you would expect with a, well, a public sector organization with that kind of history, along with that came a lot of manual kind of processes and methods. A few tech stacks, but a lot of stuff was very much done on paper in those days. Since then, though, tech adoption has kind of flourished across the organization, culminating probably most publicly, as you may have noticed, with the first UK digital by default census this last year. Along with those processes and methods, and as tech started to branch out across the organization, Along with that came a whole raft of revision control tools. Generally, if you've probably heard of it, the ONS probably used it somewhere and is potentially still using it somewhere now. Um, and that would be anything from you know, just copying files around, you know, your dot olds, to actual proper revision control systems, and a whole raft of like vendor-specific stuff that if you're not working with very specific tools, you probably won't have come across. But they're probably embedded in the ONS somewhere. Now, naturally, you don't necessarily have to coalesce everything onto a single tool, um, but generally having a lot of disparate ways of doing the same thing you know, is less desirable because it leads to knowledge siloing, single points of failure. It makes it hard for people to be able to move around teams, et cetera, and upskill and cross-skill, which is 
naturally not a good thing. In addition, as mentioned, the ONS is a public sector organization, which means ostensibly it's paid for by the British public. And with that in mind, a mandate came down from central government a little while ago, and GDS, Government Digital Service, that everything that can be open sourced, that they do, should be open sourced. This is for a variety of reasons, um, not least the fact that technically you paid for it, so you should be able to see what you're getting for your money, and if any of the code is useful to you, you should be able to leverage it and use it yourselves. This also leads to transparency in how some of the statistics are generated um, within the bounds of a few things, obviously like confidentiality, data protection, the odd bit of national security. But generally, um, having that transparency can lead to more confidence that the statistics that you're seeing are actually real and haven't just been pulled out of the air, which is very important when government policy is based on some of these statistics. Now, for these reasons and a few others, it was decided to start looking at using a cloud-based uh, revision control system for a nice, easy way of open sourcing things to the public. And around 2015-16, some of the newer Greenfield teams that were using, well, that were starting to build some of the census digital prototypes adopted GitHub. From those early beginnings, uh, just like a few very focused teams with just a few members, adoption grew. And at the point where I left the ONS in early 2020, there were about 300 odd users, um, over 100 GitHub teams. That isn't actually strictly analogous to physical teams, but 100 GitHub teams and up to just over a 1,000 repositories. Now, in the grand scheme of things, that's probably not huge. There are other organizations out there with thousands of repositories, for example. But for a large public sector organization that uh, doesn't have a lot of necessary cloud in its history, this is all quite new to this kind of area, that was quite the expansion in a fairly short space of time. And naturally, with expansion like this comes challenges, uh, not least around security, of course. Whereas some of, say, the newer teams were already very au fait in this world, um, a lot of them have maybe come in from other organizations where this sort of stuff was already being used. Some of the more legacy teams, through you know, naturally no fault of their own, have just been using very particular internal technologies for a long time. So open sourcing stuff in general was very new to them. Things they wrote, they wrote very much with the expectation that no one else outside their team would ever see the code. Um, so potentially things might be in there that could be commercially sensitive that you know, shouldn't be open sourced, for example. And even things like being used to using like multi-factor authentication were to some of these teams quite a new thing doesn't mean they didn't have security considerations before, but the kind of areas where they focused those considerations were generally different. They were layered at you know, different levels. So naturally, the ONS wanted to look at having a good way of keeping kind of governance and security over this kind of expansion. And for a while, they started experimenting with the GUHU tool from The Guardian. Um, it basically is a GitHub user auditing system. The biggest problem from an ONS point of view was that it was written in Scala. And nothing against Scala as a language, but the ONS didn't have a lot of people in-house that could actually code Scala. If they just wanted to, say, pull out of GitHub, install it, and just use it, that's not so much of an issue because you can just black box it and it'll just work. But very much they were going to probably want to extend the tool, add new functionality it didn't already have that was very specific to their use case, and at the very least write their own rule sets, which were in Scala. So having a tool that would potentially become mission critical, because it's in the security and auditing space, 
with very few people in-house who could support it is naturally not super desirable. With that in mind, um, during some of my learning and development time, back in 2019, I started developing my own tool along the same lines that would be more eminently suitable for the ONS's current architecture and be more supportable generally across the organization. And naturally, because I'm here at a Go conference, I chose to write it in Go. Now, this isn't just because I'm a massive gopher and I love writing code in Go, but also Go has some very desirable qualities that I was looking for when writing this tool. I was very much, I mean, as you can probably guess from the title of the talk, going to write this in a serverless-based manner. And in that kind of serverless world where you very much get charged for the amount of time you take to execute something, a language that executes quickly is you know, a very good thing. The faster you can do the thing you need to do and get out, the cheaper it's going to be. That also folds into, again, being a public sector organization, because any money I was spending doing this or running this is public money. And therefore, you know, as a good citizen, you want to spend as little of the public money as possible, or indeed be able to do it for free, if possible. Following on from the supportability issue um, of potentially supporting Scala, Go has uh, a reputation for being relatively simple to learn. It's usually quite easy for an existing software engineer to be able to just pick up and run with it. And it's also pretty simple for even people totally new to the world of software engineering to be able to be up and running and write in production code fairly quickly. So even where there were teams that didn't necessarily already have Go skills, they could quite easily be able to pick it up. There's also the consideration, though, that at the time, Go was also being rolled out very much across the organization as well. And there were teams that were already writing almost exclusively in Go, and many other teams that were very much had at least some services in Go, or at least some tooling, and they were moving towards putting more stuff into Go. So it was going to be a well-supported language across the organization anyway. And as a final point, um, it's very well supported across the cloud services that I was intending to use. So there I wasn't going to have to do any kind of like language shimming or anything to you know, get it to work with the services I want. It's natively supported. So history aside, let's go on to the slightly more fun technical stuff, which I'm sure you're probably actually here for. When I started developing uh, the tool, um, Who Goes There? It's you know, an amazing pun, obviously. Uh, I came up with a core set of technologies that I wanted to use that I believed was going to enable me to rapidly develop initially a prototype that would be useful quickly, but would then be easily extensible to be able to layer in more functionality. As I said, I was building this primarily in learning and development time, so I didn't have 100% of my day job to uh, commit to it. So anything I could use that would accelerate development and get me to something that could be potentially useful to the organization quickly was something that was going to be very useful to me. To that end, I chose it to build it uh, serverless, specifically with AWS Lambda. I was going to deploy it with a serverless framework, communicate with GitHub via the GraphQL API that they provide, and also then build it using an event-driven model, specifically with using AWS SQS queues. It's worth noting that you know, there's a lot of AWS there. And the reason it's primarily AWS is because that was the primary cloud I had access to at the ONS at the time. Uh, they were very much experimenting across clouds, but AWS was a core cloud, so I already had accounts which were already hooked up to things like billing, security, monitoring, and all the rest of the stuff that you'd like. So it was just out of the box. I could just get up and running quickly. Some of the philosophy behind this, though, is everything I've done I've done with an eye that you could 
not lift and shift, but you could, with minimal effort, rebuild this into a different cloud. So everything that can be common and not have to be rewritten is. Um, and the cloud-specific bits are chosen such that there should be at least functional equivalence in the other major cloud providers. So to get started, why do they go with Lambda, or serverless functions, as it were? For anyone unfamiliar with a serverless function, it's essentially what it says. It's a way of running code without having to manage or provision servers. That was naturally very desirable to me, uh, because again, I could start writing functionality quickly that would be useful without having to worry about spending a lot of time building the foundations to even get to that level. There are many pros and cons to Lambda, uh, and serverless functions in general. It's definitely not a magic bullet solution. I wouldn't recommend it for every single thing you're going to build. Um, some things you know, are almost the antithesis of these if you use it for the wrong purposes. But some of the pros that brought me to serverless specifically were these. So it was likely to be very cost effective. As I've touched on, I wanted it to be cheap to run. My execution model was very much going to be a wake up, do a thing, go back to sleep, and then pretty much you know, run that once a day, maybe once a week. It was going to be very sparse execution, so I didn't need a container running all the time. Um, and just pay as you go, as it were, worked very well for that model. It's also worth noting that certainly at the time, with what I built, uh, I, and I know they do shift what's in and out every now and again, all this ran under the AWS free tier. So it could be run basically free of charge, which, again, is a nice bonus. Uh, lambdas and serverless functions work well with events. And I wanted to build this as an event-driven model, so they just natively support that, which is fantastic. As I said, there's no servers to manage, so I could just get on with functionality rather than worrying about server boxes. And as a last point, and it's something that I believe was fairly particular to AWS at the time, although it may exist in other clouds, but just AWS was where I was more familiar, is a concept called destinations. These are a way of essentially configuring a set of on success or on failure targets from your Lambda, which will receive a payload, whether it succeeds or fails. And just to step into that, what that really means, as an example, my first Lambda essentially does a thing and then wants to put a report onto a queue for a, another Lambda to pick up. Now, I could absolutely do that just using the AWS SDK. I could create a client. I could connect to the queue. I could you know, wrap the message, publish the message. However, using destinations, all you have to do is configure the Lambda to have a on-success destination of the ARN, the Amazon resource number, essentially, of the queue you want to post to. And then in Go, very literally, just return a struct. So what I'm doing is creating, you know, in this case, just a vanilla struct. There's no particular interface to it. It is just a struct. And then it's just a return value from the function. Again, when I'm trying to develop stuff rapidly and just get to the functionality quickly, that's um, you know, excellent. You can get up and running very quickly. It also means if I wanted to swap that SQSQ out that I was publishing to, I don't have to actually rewrite all the code. I just change the destination. And then the Lambda destination system takes care of all the routing and all the plumbing under the hood. Why serverless framework? This is one of the two technologies that I will admit I used partly because I wanted to learn them. Uh, so this was learning and development time, so it was as much about me learning new technology as it was trying to build something useful for the ONS. And I hadn't actually used serverless uh, framework before. For those who haven't seen it, 
it's essentially a flavor of infrastructure as code, so similar to kind of Terraform or maybe CloudFormation, and it does kind of wrap on top of that. So, for example, in the serverless manifests I've written, there is actually CloudFormation embedded in them for some of the bits it didn't quite support at the time. But essentially, it's, it's, it's just a way of doing infrastructure as code. That's generally a good thing because it gives you, as long as you've not done something really badly wrong, reliable and repeatable builds. So you can build it in one environment. You want to move it to staging, production. You can just basically press a button to do it. You want to build a debug environment to figure out an issue. You can quickly just deploy it straight to there. Also, a very good example of where that is incredibly useful is this specific talk. Because, as I said, I basically built this two years ago. And a lot has happened in the last two years, as you may have noticed. I've, not least the fact that I've also changed jobs. And if I hadn't written this as the majority infrastructure as code, it would have been a nightmare to try and remember what I did to deploy it the first time round. I mean, I could have written notes and stuff, but you know, going through and clicking stuff in the interface would have been just tedious. Having it all as infrastructure as code meant, bar a couple of little tweaks I did have to make because the serverless framework has moved on a couple of versions in the meantime, but minor tweaks, I could essentially just point at a new AWS account and just deploy it, which you know, has to be a good thing, right? The serverless framework, very much as it says, is built for serverless applications. So a lot of stuff that you may have to, say, in Terraform, specifically do yourself around the plumbing to you know, deploy a Lambda, to various security groups, all that kind of stuff, is very much built into the framework. So you still do those things, but you do them with a lot less code, because it naturally that's what it's designed to do. Again, rapid development. It has cross-cloud support. That doesn't mean 100% cloud agnostic, obviously, because you know, almost nothing is. As I said, I did write some specific cloud formation for this. But the system itself does support multi-cloud deploy deployment. So as long as you have the appropriate code and the appropriate manifest, you can use the same scripts to deploy to different clouds. So again, in the future, if I'd wanted to write, say, a GCP or an Azure version, I could just write the relevant bits, but still use the same system to deploy it without having to write a huge amount of different stuff. And as a last little advantage, um, and it, it's one I like about it, it very much packages almost your entire ap application together into a single deploy, as a lot of good infrastructure as code does. But whereas you know, again, potentially with something like Terraform, you may Terraform some uh, infrastructure, but then need to run the AWS CLI to actually push services or to do other stuff. This is very much a one-click deploy. I mean, if you got really complicated, it may not package as well. But in my experience, you can deploy it with one command, you can update it with a single command, and you can pull the whole thing back down in a single command. The pulling back down is quite important because I've had bad experiences with other systems where you delete stuff and it leaves a whole raft of stuff actually still in your AWS account because it didn't quite know to delete that security group or something. This has always, in my experience, cleanly pulled everything down. The only thing it leaves behind is the S3 bucket that it uses for state, but you can just manually delete that. Why GraphQL? This is the second one. Again, I've not used GraphQL before at this point, so this was a fantastic opportunity to use it. I was lucky because GitHub provides a GraphQL API alongside the RESTful API. Um, naturally, if the service you want to con consume doesn't give you a GraphQL API to call, you can't use it. Um, if you've not come across GraphQL, it's essentially an API language. And it differs mostly from a RESTful language, um, approach in that it's schema-based rather than endpoint-based. So with GraphQL, there is a single endpoint that you call. 
and what you then get depends on what you ask it for. You essentially have the whole schema of maybe, maybe thousands of fields, and you just specify the ones you want, you send it to the server, it fills those in and sends it back. That's a massive oversimplification, but from a client point of view, that's what it does. This gives you advantages of like no over or under fetching. For example, in a RESTful endpoint may return you 100 fields, and you always get those 100 fields whether you want them or not. With GraphQL, if you only want the two, you only ask for the two, and you only get the two. It also means, again, for like under fetching, you don't have to say, call an endpoint to get a user record, and then iterate through a whole set of IDs that, that gave you back, and then call a whole set of other endpoints to aggregate that data. All the aggregation is done on the server side. It's very client focused. Um, it was developed by Facebook, really mostly for like mobile applications and such, so it's very focused around reducing network traffic and overhead. And again, just making those clients a lot simpler. And as a last point, again, there's many pros and cons, but as, as a last point, um, because it's schema based, that basically gives you built in type validation and checking which makes debugging and stuff a whole lot easier, and also gives you advantages such as introspection. So if you don't actually know the API, you know, the schema itself, you can interrogate the endpoint and get the schema. GraphQL is also inherently self-documenting, so you know, no another advantage. There's a couple of quick comparisons between GraphQL and REST I'm not going to overly dwell on. Um, fantastic blog post where I got them from at the bottom. If you want to go there, you, you get a much better explanation. But it all boils down to, again, it's the responsibility for doing most of the stuff is on the server. So when I come from pros and cons on this, it comes very much from a client point of view. If you were to be writing the GraphQL server, that's a whole different ballgame because all the responsibility of aggregation is on you and you know, caching and all. You don't get like HTTP cache, caching as you would do with a RESTful service. Um, so yeah, ho whole different ball game. But as a consumer of GraphQL, my life is really easy because it's designed to make the client's life very easy. And then just as a final point on this one, why event driven? Um, an event-driven architecture, in a nutshell, is based around producing events, something in the middle to route those events, and things to consume the events. Events can be absolutely anything, from a user's logged into your service, um, you know, database records being updated, a particular date's passed, I mean, anything, really. And this gives you a lot of complications. Um, but also a lot of advantages. So, as I say, it could be anything, but it lends itself to being able to much more easily decouple services, which, say, it's great for extensibility, we'll get onto, but it means that I could say write a user login service that doesn't have to care what any of the rest of the system does. It just lets the user log in, it then fires an event off into the ether that basically says user x blah, blah, blah has logged in and forgets about it. Anything that consumes those events could be a completely different team um, with the obvious advantages that comes there. And really, ultimately, say it enables extensibility. I was building this, as I said, very much as a very quick prototype that would be useful quickly, but would then be easy to extend. If I had to make all my architectural design choices up front to know what every single part of the system was going to do, I would probably never have actually got around to writing a line of code. Or I would have spent a lot of time rewriting a lot of stuff. Whereas doing it this way lets me build a simple core that I can then extend out, add services in, add new producers, add new consumers. And there may be the odd tweak, but generally, probably never having to go back and rewrite any of the services I've already written. As a last point, um, one of the most important bits, of course, is the bit in the middle. And 
There's a variety of mechanisms for this. Generally, they come down to basically being queues. I'm specifically using SQS queues because they are, as the name suggests, simple queuing system. They are simple. There are functional equivalents in other clouds. Um, and they play well with things like destinations, as I mentioned earlier. And they're very easy to deploy with a serverless framework. Other systems obviously exist. I mean, so you could use Kafka, you know, Rabbit queues, or the you know, quite obviously named AWS Event Bridge, which is very much designed for event routing. Uh, so I went with a simple solution because it was quick, easy to get started, and because of the way it's, everything's plugged in, I could at some point rip those queues out and replace them with EventBridge, for example. So now we've seen kind of what it comprises and hopefully why I made some of those choices, we can look at uh, some of the code. So just at a high level of what currently exists, the current process is extremely straightforward. Um, for an event-driven system, it's probably the simplest you can actually get at this stage. Essentially, I've got a lambda up front called the checker lambda, which is activated by a CloudWatch event, essentially like a cron job, just a, a scheduled event, which then wakes up, calls the GraphQL API on GitHub, compiles a report from the data it got back, sticks that report onto a queue, and then that queue gets picked up by a notifier consumer, which then, at the moment, just notifies off into a Slack channel with some of the statistics that it got back. Just before we step into the actual code, a um, couple of notes. Uh, if anyone wants to quickly follow along, it's actually all there, if you want to very quickly do that. Um, the code examples on the slides are very much paraphrased to hopefully make sure they fit on. So I've shortened variable names and things from the actual code to make them fit on here. The examples aren't Go formatted, because if they were, again, a lot of the formatting would make them actually hard to read on slides. The actual code is Go formatted. So, you know, don't worry about that. Uh, and, I've, and generally, in examples where it's like a package, I've omitted like the package declarations and various, you know, any other like furniture, like imports that aren't strictly important to the thing that I'm showing at the time. But again, every slide also has a link to the actual code file where that code is from. So if you want to see it properly in context, it's easier to link back. A quick overview of the repository layout itself. Um, in the same spirit, I've omitted the top level stuff, which is like the Go mod, the Go sum, you know, the README, the license, and all that kind of stuff. But generally, it's going to look fairly familiar to you if you've seen any kind of modern Go repository. Um, it's got some very familiar pieces in it. The CMD here only contains an example command line runner that I was using just to test some of the functions um, outside of Lambda partially to make sure that I wasn't doing anything in the lambdas that I wasn't doing in a common library, so I didn't you know, ruin my not quite cloud agnosticness. The PKG, the packages, again, is where all the common code sits, so they can be shared. So if I wanted to, say, rewrite this in GCP or Azure, I don't have to re rewrite whole swathes of chunks of functionality. I can just call the library functions I've already written. Speaking of the cloud specifics, then there's an AWS folder which contains the actual Lambda code and the serverless deployment manifests, therefore. If there was to be a GCP version, there would be like a GCP folder and an Azure folder. That's where kind of the serverless framework comes in. That's a very serverless framework repository layout. You generally have a separate um, cloud folder per deploy. And that's partly what gives it its cross-cloudness. You can then tell it just to target whichever one you want at any particular time. And just the resources thing on the end has a few gopher avatars that I was using for like um, yeah, Slack avatars to make the messages look a bit prettier. So dropping into the first Lambda, which lives in AWS Functions Checker, If you've seen a Go Lambda before, it's going to look very familiar to you. 
or if you've ever read the AWS docs, it's going to look very familiar to you because it's not doing anything esoteric. It's just a Go-based Lambda. Like any uh, general Go program, it all lives in a main package, and it starts with a main function. Though, in this case, the main function only exists to call the AWS SDK function lambda.start, which itself just invokes the handler. In this case, the handler gets invoked with a context and a CloudWatch event payload. The signature of that depends on the trigger that's going to your Lambda. So as we'll see with the other Lambda in a minute, it get, that gets a different payload. But this is triggered from a CloudWatch event, so that's the payload it gets. Then just to touch on the, on the return, as I said, because of using destinations, all I'm doing is returning a vanilla struct and a standard Go error type. As with any Lambda, if that error is ever non-nil, then the Lambda will retry up to however many configured times, for example. Then dropping into the handler itself, first thing I'm doing is pulling in the environment variables. A um, couple of notes. One of the environment variables very much to this Lambda is a um, GitHub access token. And ideally, you don't want to be sticking access tokens in environment variables, because they're inherently not that secure. This is just an artifact of the rapid prototypeness of the system. But the next step after this, were I to still be developing this at the time, would be to be plugging this into something like um, AWS Secure Parameter Store or like a proper vault installation, for example, to actually properly load secrets into it. Also, this runs every single time the Lambda runs. That isn't always desirable, because if you have a Lambda that's executing hot, as it were, so it's essentially running the same code over and over again, you know, um, already running, then you don't want to have to re-import every time. It's just wasteful. But because I know my execution pattern is very much very sporadic, it's going to be maybe once a day, you know, once a week, it's always going to be a cold start for me, which means I pretty much always need to be importing the environment. And the simplest way to do it is just like this, without adding extra complexity that I didn't actually need. Then we do the actual query. We'll look at the actual query stuff in a minute, because I say it's in the shared package. The only stuff that lives in the Lambda is, apart from this little county bit here, AWS-specific stuff. So again, if you want to write GCP version, you just have to write the general wrapper and stick in exactly the same calls without having to replicate all of that stuff. But in general, it creates a client, uses that client to call GitHub, very much like a standard HTTP client, because under, under, under the hood, that's basically what it is. Then, assuming it actually gets a, re a uh, response back and does an error, then at the moment, what we're doing is running through the response and building a set of statistics based on what it got. In this case, it's counting the number of users that's in the organization, uh, how many of them are standard users, how many of them are admins, and like, how many people have MFA switched on. Then just to finish off, once we've got that report, which we'll is say just stick some numbers in the struct, we just simply return it from the function as I mentioned earlier. So as I said, there's very little in the actual Lambda itself because it's designed to be as thin layer as possible. All the actual work then gets done in the other packages. So have a quick look at the GraphQL query, which lives in PKG GitHub. So for this, I'm using the MachineBox GraphQL module. It may be a Matt Ryan module. Um, and I chose it basically because it was the right level of complexity for what I wanted to use. There are a whole raft of GraphQL libraries out there, most of them very much focused on writing the servers, more so necessarily than writing the clients. And so they tend to be 
quite low level and have a huge load of functionality and potentially a load of imports that, as a client, I don't care about. Generally, I try to operate on the principle of least dependencies. So if I don't have to bring in a module that itself imports a couple of hundred other modules, then you know, I will go with the simpler one. To that end, all we're really doing, I mean, there's more code in the actual package, but this is kind of the main part. As you see, we configure the single GraphQL endpoint, because there's only the one endpoint. And then, as I say, a bit like HTTP, we basically just get a client. All I'm really doing here is essentially wrapping the client you get from that machine box GraphQL library with a little bit of a wrapper just to insert the authentication token that I need. Um, and that's all it really has to do to make the call. And with that in mind, the query itself, apart from a whole swathe of closing brackets that would just have been pointless on this slide, that is the query. If you've never seen GraphQL before, that's what it looks like. It is very much a fragment of the schema. So if you saw the entire GitHub schema, you can kind of fit this in as a sub part of it, essentially. But some points to note, especially if you've not seen GraphQL before, the first line just opens the query, declares it as the query. And in this case, declares a couple of variables that I then want to use within the actual query. Here, I've got organization name, which, uh, which then gets used as login, but it's literally the name of the organization that you want to do the auditing for. And then a thing called after, which is essentially a pagination cursor. As with everything GraphQL, they're strongly typed, so they're both strings. The only difference being that the organization, because of that exclamation mark, is mandatory. Because you can run this query without a cursor, and it will give you the first page. But if you try to run it without an organization, it will fail before it even sends it, because it knows it's a bit pointless sending it without that information. Stepping into it then, at the first level, say I'm asking for the organization chunk of the schema. And alongside that comes what's known as a filter, which for this particular element in the schema is a mandatory thing because they won't let you just pull every bit of org you know, every organization on GitHub. So that just filters it to say, give me just the information for the organization that I want. Obviously, your access token needs to have the relevant permissions to be able to see that organization. The scopes for the token that I'm using are in the readme file of the uh, GitHub repo, otherwise I would probably have forgotten what they were. Then stepping into that, within that organization, we then want all the members along with their role, their role being whether they're a regular user or an admin. And the filter to that is the pagination filter. So as you see, we get the after cursor, which just tells you where to start. So if that doesn't exist or it's null, you start on the first page. And then I'm basically saying I want the first 100 records after that point. Inside that, we get the total count, which is the number of records that got returned on that page. At the moment, that will always be 100 until it's the last page, in which it will probably be less. If you supplied potentially other things into the filter, then you might be getting potentially sparse pages. So they won't necessarily all be that number. Next thing down is a very pagination specific object, which just gives you a little bit extra info about the actual page itself. The has next page is probably a bit obvious. It tells you whether there's another page to fetch, so you know if you actually need to go and do another round trip. And the end cursor is then the one you resupply into the after to do the next call for the next page. As I say, the this is a fragment of a schema. If you look at the actual full spec, there are a whole range of other fields that you can return in that block. I'm not using them, so I don't ask for them, and that, so the server doesn't have to waste any resources given them to me. Then we get into the bit that gets slightly conceptually complicated, 
and that's because it gets into the concepts of edges and nodes, which I will admit, when I first started doing stuff for GraphQL, were the bits that kind of broke me. Conceptually, it's kind of quite straightforward, because it is just paging, ultimately, but there are slightly different ways you can call it in different contexts, and it does get a bit confusing. I'm certainly not an expert on it. As far as I understand it, it very much comes from the graph database roots of Facebook, where, and again, I'm no graph database expert, a node is fairly analogous to the actual data record in, say, a traditional database, and the edges are the relations or kind of characteristics of that record. So in this case, what we're getting is, if we dig right down, the node, which is the actual user record, which, again, actually has hundreds of fields that you can call, like what repos they have access to, what pull requests they've just done, you know, whatever. But for now, I just want name and login. And then outside of that are the edges of that node, which are kind of its relations or characteristics, which in this case are where it defines what role that person has, and whether they have multi-factor authentication enabled. Again, there's a whole raft of other ones that do exist. I'm not currently using them, so I'm not asking for them. But hopefully, you can see how that's easy to extend, though, because I don't then have to add in potentially another RESTful call to call some other data. I just extend what I'm asking for in the schema, and I just get that information back. Naturally, once we've actually compiled a report, we need to actually do something with it. The very, very, very first version of this just basically wrote it to a CloudWatch log, um, just to prove the point. But that's not particularly useful to anyone unless people are going in and checking CloudWatch logs every day, which you know, I doubt anyone's going to do. So there is a notifier lambda, which in this case is a Slack notifier. I chose Slack because it was very well used in the ONS at the time. It was like a primary communication uh, system for most of the software engineers. It was already being used for monitoring and alerting, as I'm sure it is in a lot of places. So it was it's a familiar tool for people, and it wasn't, I wasn't like asking them to look at a system they weren't already using. It's worth noting as a last point on that, that there are many different ways of posting a message to Slack. There is a fully featured API, which lets you do all kinds of funky interactions. So you can like, be able to click on a button in the message to like, you know, get it to do something back to the server. But all I needed to do at the minute was quite literally post a message. So for that, I just used the webhook uh, route. Because again, it was the simplest to get up and running with quickly, and it did what I wanted. There's no reason why I couldn't swap that out again in the future for so the API, because, again, I wrote it in a package on its own, so it would be easier to change. The notifier lambda is very similar to the checker lambda. That's why I've cut out the package and the main functions, because they are exactly identical. The only difference is in with the actual code it runs in the handler. And say at the top, now we get an SQS event payload as opposed to a CloudWatch payload, because this lambda is now triggered off the queue, not off the CloudWatch event. First thing we do, import environment variables in exactly the same way as the other one did. It's just a different set of environment variables. This one contains like the Slack token. We then range over the records that we get back in that uh, event because an SQS event can give you one record, or it could give you multiple records, because it can batch them up. So you want to make sure you go through all of them. They come through, essentially, as just JSON. So standardly, we just unmarshal them into a handy struct. Again, nothing special, just a struct. And then once we have those numbers, we use those to compile the actual message, which we'll look at in the next slide, and just post it to the webhook. For this, I'm using the Slack Blocks API, um, which 
essentially lets you use your kind of visual blocks to create a pretty message. Uh, I could have done it as just plain text and just have a message, but you know, I wanted to sell this as a bit of a, you know, hey, this is a good system that you might want to adopt and use, so I wanted it to look pretty. It's probably very similar to you know, other systems. It's a bit similar to like HTML, I guess. You, know, you have different blocks that have different types and display differently. And ultimately, that's the message. It's just a JSON document. I absolutely could have built that just using a template or you know, some strategic sprint Fs. But because I wanted this to be slightly more generic, because I wanted to potentially use this in other systems, um, I wrote a little package that is essentially a set of nested structs and some handy constants that you can use just to define that, and then use Go's built-in marshalling to just marshal it into JSON. So that's what it actually builds. That's what comes out the other end. There are a whole range of visual blocks available. Uh, some give you like interactive controls. Some of them give you images. But I'm just using some of the you know, more standard ones. So it just has like a header, which gives you some nice bold text, a little visual di divider line, just you know, cause uh, a section block, which is just basically normal content, and then a pretty little context block, which gives you a little italic footer on the bottom. Most of these blocks support Markdown. Annoyingly, the title doesn't, but the others do. And so. I wanted to display the output as a table. Unfortunately, Slack doesn't support markdown tables. So I'm using a code block and a couple of strategic sprint Fs to formulate just a little kind of code table. And then once all that comes together, it ends up looking like that. It's not a fantastic reproduction on the screen, but you know, it, it, it's generally like that. And those are some of the gopher images that are in the resources folder. So at this stage, yes, it's not hugely impressive as what comes out the other end. But this was kind of, as I say, it's the first pass of something that's still useful to the organization to know how many people are currently up, signed up for their GitHub, I say, how the adoption's going, and quite importantly, how many people are adopting MFA, and very importantly, whether any of your admin users aren't using MFA at the time. As I said, I built this, so this is the first pass, but then you could very easily expand it by adding new services that say, if somebody hasn't got MFA switched on, or you know, hasn't, say, uh, published anything to Slack in the past three months, you could raise an issue on it, you could send it out to some compliance thing, to say, you know, should this person still be in your organization, for example? The possibilities are almost endless, depending on what you want to get back from the GitHub API. And like I said, I built it like that because I didn't want to spend all that time up front thinking, oh, I want it to do this and I want it to do that, because I pretty much would never have got around to actually writing anything because I know what I'm like. I'm not going to run a live demo because it would take way too long, and it is not the most stimulating thing to watch infrastructure deploying. But if anyone does actually want to see it deploying, because I guarantee it does work, or it did you know, last week, um, I'm quite happy to run it and deploy it out to AWS and show you it running. But you know, just catch me after. Otherwise, uh, thanks for sitting through it. Hope you're all still awake, and you know, don't worry, it's lunch soon. Um, you can find me. Twitter, GitHub, totally unrelated artwork on Instagram, always you know, shilling that. And the code and indeed the slides are already up in GitHub if you want to have a look through them. Otherwise, we may unfortunately have time for questions if anyone wants to ask anything. <laughs> Make sure if someone else asks, they're all the way over there, so we have to run. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Great talk, by the way. Um, thank so, you. quick question is about SQS. Um, yeah. So, um, as far as I know, SQS doesn't really persist your messages for a long time. 
Uh, was that important? Not at all. Uh, if it was, would you, what would you use in the you know, serverless environment? Um, so it's configurable as to how long they persist for. But yeah, in, in this system at the minute, it's not that important because they weren't going to hang around very long. They're very much going to be fired and consumed pretty quickly. Um, as I said, if I wanted to put something that were fully featured into there, that's where I'd probably look at maybe plugging in something like EventBridge, which is obviously much more designed exactly for this purpose. It's just for what I was building at the time, that was kind of overkill. Um, because I, said I wanted to build this quickly and get it running, and I didn't know EventBridge at all. SQS I knew, so it was the quickest thing to get started with. But absolutely, yes, if th that became a requirement, the components are much more easily switchable. OK, makes sense. Thanks. No, well, I've got one. Oh, oh, oh hang oh. on. <laughs> Um, thanks for the talk, first of all. No so um, I worked in the past in multiple projects with a similar architecture mm. with Lambda, SQS, and stuff like that. And the problems, I, the problem I always found with the type of architecture is the local development, local testing, mm. all that kind of things. Yes. Uh, how did you manage that? If you find <laughs> a solution, I don't know. Um, so no, I didn't get any local testing. Um, I mostly leveraged the fact that because serverless framework is so good at putting stuff up, taking it down. I could very rapidly just stand it up, test it, bring it down, stand it up. And I basically kind of set my schedule to say run every couple of minutes. So I could just put it up, wait a couple of minutes. Did that do what I wanted to? Oh, no, it errored. Quickly change it, put it back up, put it back up. There are things like local stack, I believe, that um, you can use. But I've never personally used it. Um, but yeah, I think there are options that you can run a lot of the AWS stuff kind of stubbed out locally, I do believe. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and again, by using a lot of standard components, hopefully that kind of thing would be more supported rather than doing a lot of esoteric, like, you know, custom stuff. OK, thanks. And you could use that pattern to solve lots of problems, couldn't you? It doesn't have to just be that specific. Well, ex exactly, that, that, that's the point. This is kind of just a, I say, it, it, you could get the theory out of just try something out very quickly because, yeah, with an event-driven pattern, you can do anything. You can fire any events you want. You could, say, have something that if the thousandth customer logs in, you know, you fire your office confetti cannon or you, you send them a, a free gopher or something. And again, you don't have to worry about that when you first start building the system. You can plug that in later when marketing suddenly decides it's a great idea without having to go, oh, no, I've now got to completely rewrite my login service. Yeah, brilliant. John, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for that talk. It was great.